This here is the all-new BMW X1 as petrol, diesel, plug-in hybrid or all-electric iX1 soon coming up for you as well. Today also with the driving part with Thomas on Autogefühl for you. Storm Bay Metallic is this very interesting color, especially here with the beautiful raindrops on the paint. When you have the, the combustion engine, as it is right here, vertical fins in the huge double kidney and then there are some openings here and there then after that adaptive they open just on demand the ix1 just looks a little bit different but not too much in the lower part this is the m sport line so a sportier lower design here with the honeycomb structure so overall a stronger stance for the x1 in this new generation it also has wider tracks that will also have an impact on the driving experience later on to come four meters 50 or 177 inches is the length of the new x1 or ix1 as well then and that means it has Again, just slight in length, five centimeters or two inches, so not too much. Wheels from 17 to 20 inch. These are the 19 inch. However, soon on the iX1 car, we also have 20 inch wheels for you. This one with the M Sport and the side profile means the wheel arches are painted in the vehicle color. Otherwise, you would have, for example, also a contrasting look. There's also the X line available, for example, then with painted black wheel arches as a contrast side profile more form for this function upright style it looks like a grown-up suv already from the outside here indeed flush door handles that makes a more aerodynamic design and this is also the scheme about this vehicle everything that is basically built on the exterior here for example also with small vortex generators they have reduced the wind resistance on everything that is attached on the outside let's see because the battery, for example, for the iX1 won't be that big, sumo deals to that, but they say that no matter which engine you pick, it should be very efficient as for the fuel or energy consumption. We will find out if that's true today. Then, towards the side profile here in the rear, this is very interesting too, because the tail lamps are very three-dimensional here. Very well, you can see that, so pretty strong design, M Sport and with contrasting lower part. And overall, I think, it looks modern, but still in an evolutionary way. So I think design-wise here for a compact SUV, they really nailed it. What about you? Tell me in the comments. And this one in here, the xDrive 23i. At this moment here, the strongest pure petrol engine. Soon more about the engines. The top speed, by the way, for the iX1, for the all-electric version, is 180 kilometers an hour or 112 miles per hour. So I think also fairly enough, the petrol engines go even faster then. You either get a base suspension or, as an alternative, the adaptive M suspension. And we also have these adaptive dampers on this vehicle here today. We're going to test them in a later driving part. And here we can see a different color. Cape York Green is that paint name. And also we can see the X line here. We have the contrasting wheel arches, but painted in black then. Shiny style, very interesting. These are also 19-inch wheels. And the X-Line, you can see you have some gray contrast or silver contrast in the lower part. And here a more off-roadish contrast style or crossover style. So this would be the less sporty look then in contrast to the M Sport. Then here more, yeah, once again, more this original off-road character. Tell me what do you like best. Even more variation for you. This one here is in Utah orange and also the X line once again. Vertical fins and here the contrasting silver in the lower part. Looks really cool, I think. And special, maybe you've seen it here, 21 inch wheels from the M performance parts. So this is then the special edition you can get, not directly from Configurator, but from the M performance parts. Really striking, but maybe a little bit too much, isn't it? And here also with the fitting roof box, if you want even more space. Yeah, what do you think about this adventure styling here? And this here is the all-electric BMW iX1. And the very interesting thing is, you can't really see that's an electric one, because, well, on the standard side, it would come with more blue accentuation. But you can depick it for a normal non-EV look, and I think that's a good thing that you can choose if you want to have it more EV looking, or not. The only thing you cannot depict is here, the blue ring around the BMW logo. That is always staying like this, so that would be the only thing you can see from the outside. Other than that, you can pick your favorite styling. For example, here, the M Sport with a really sporty kidney, in this case, then all the way closed in the front. 
That's a thing you know you can also see and also hear the i logo, but not from a distance. And also the M Sport has the more sporty accentuations here in the lower part. Here also with the color, with the matte color, frozen gray, really, yeah, really stunning style, isn't it? And also in the side profile, you can't see it's an EV. Here the M Sport and the frozen gray. Once again, these wheel arches are painted in vehicle color, 20 inch wheels. So this is actually, yeah, the sportiest look then for the all new BMW X1. And yeah, indeed, you can pick this as an EV or a non EV, and you can just pick your own styling. I think it's actually a good idea that it doesn't scream out, hey, I'm an EV. Or what do you think about this? Should an electric vehicle look like an EV? Or rather like this. And in the rear here, inside the BMW plant, we can also very well see the tail lamps here in a three-dimensional style. X-Drive 30. Then for the iX1, this is the only thing you can see in the rear. Then that's the iX1. And then once again, the M Sport styling with the black accentuation here in the lower part and a huge diffuser style. Yeah, and at least <laughs> also no fake exhaustives. <laughs> And this is the iX1 in mineral white and also with the standard blue accentuations here around the double kidney, for example, and also in the lower part. So this is the iX1 as it would normally look. And then you can, as I said, depick it just without any extra cost. You can also see in the side profile, this again with the 20-inch wheels here, there's the blue accentuation in the side bumper as well. And also in the rear, there are two more blue accentuations. I think it looks quite cool. Um, doesn't look too electric either, but what about you? So would you go for the blue accentuations or not? Elegant khaki, very light, and here with the M colors in the M Sport styling. You see here the flush door handles and they fold up then like this and still give you a very good haptic feedback. Door closing sound, yeah, pretty solid here. Things better than in the early studio stages. And then here, soft touch, it's a high grade leatherette sensor tech out the inside of the doors. Harman Kahn sound system, good for music lovers indeed. Here, more extravagant styling here for the door handles, and this is a normal opening from the inside. So they thought about a lot of interesting structures here. Once again, the mirroring the Harman Kardon design on the top part then. M Sport also on the interior means we have here the M Sport steering wheel with these special accentuations that looks really cool. I will soon also show you the base steering wheel, but this one here, yeah, definitely a cooler look overall. Then here the instruments and the infotainment form one unit. Soon more deals about that. SensorTech dashboard here and also SensorTech seats, high grade leatherette, now in perforation in black, beige, red, brown, available on basically all markets. And there's also the Alcantara seat available. And even on the US market, they offer now the Alcantara seat. That is big news. We had it in our, um, in our studio episode earlier, the Alcantara seat. That is also a very good choice. But here also the CenterTech seats. First of all, the seat form is very good. The sport version here also, so you are being kept quite tight also in corners but still offers enough decent comfort soft material so you have in this vehicle here now especially in the new generation a seating comfort that is really comparable with way bigger SUVs indeed that's a very good achievement then with 189 six with two a lot of headroom left this one the one with the panoramic roof which I shouldn't open right now because it's raining um, well, not too hard at the moment, but still here, yeah, we take all chances for you that you can see everything. A wide opening, you can leave a lot of uh, light on the inside. And for really hot days, you can also close that whole shade. That's, of course, also a very important thing to do, especially when we think about the U.S. customers. And we are here at the Regensburg plant today in Germany. So this one here, the X1, the X2, the 1 series, they are built here in Regensburg, Germany, in Bavaria and not in Spartanburg in the US. Spartanburg in the US, you build X3, X4, X5, X6, X7. So there's this split because the X1 is also way more often sold in Europe, for example. Clean yet sporty interior, especially here in the M Sport trim. I mentioned the steering wheel, which has, by the way, still manual knobs here on the steering wheel, no hashtag capacitive BS. That's really lovely. And also here are uh, shifting pedals, for example. The boost function, by the way, is when you press and hold the left shifting pedal, and then you have manual shifts down to have a 
quicker boost and also on the motorway, for example. And then here in the M Sport, we also have this like the structured aluminum style look that looks really cool and also less black piano like I use, for example. Also great build quality from this high-grade leather at center tech dashboard and it feels really soft, it has a structure on the inside, so yeah, really great this material evolvement. Then you have these dual screens here on the left side 10.25 inch, on the right side 10.7 inch. Here you can already see the Apple CarPlay integration, Android Auto also possible, both wireless only actually. I like the possibility to con control also with a cable. Yeah, but um, let's see if it's reliable here um, uh, in the remainder of our review. And the Harman Kardon sound system here, let's test it. See how it... Oh yeah, that's very clear. Mm, yeah, a lot of speakers here, 12 speakers. And yeah, cool. It's a nice so uh, song, by the way. Yeah, so for music lovers, definitely would recommend that. And let's check out the BMW OS8 system. That's the new here in this vehicle. I always prefer the overview from the older OS7. Um, there's also no control knob in the lower part than here for this system. So you have uh, only the touch possibility. That's a catch. And also touch here for the temperature control. That's what I preferred in the previous generation. I still had real dials. But at least they always stay in this area. And wow, it's beautiful ambient lighting integration below that. That's actually pretty cool. The responsive of the system is actually quite nice. Here, once again, huge BMW plant in Regensburg as well. There are bigger ones worldwide, yes, but also have like a 9,000 people of workforce here for the smaller and compact models than of, of BMW. The overview from the menu looks like this, a little bit of an overload, too many apps, so more complexity for the system. You have some hotkeys here on the left side, but they are also just, you know, in this you know, like touch style, so just on the screen, actually. And this is the thing about the OS8. So I did some testing here with some apps and so on, also with the instruments. And with OS7, I had never, ever any failures, freezes, something. And now, it happened a couple of times. Here now, for example, nothing is happening. BMW internal GPS works, but I can't access the CarPlay somehow. I don't know why. And also here left side on the, uh, on the instruments, when I put push the option button, usually these options would appear where I can scroll them through. At this moment, there's a freeze. Also, when I have the Apple Maps on the right side and I want to have them on the left side, it doesn't work for the first time. You have to shut down the vehicle. Then they appear actually shut down for example, open the door, then everything goes black, then restart the system, and then the maps go back to the system that you can also see on the left side. Let's see if CarPlay works now after this startup. No, maybe we have to do it one more time or put the car to sleep for a couple of minutes. Yeah, there we go. There we are again. So, I mean, everything works at some point, and most of the time it does work. But the thing is that you have some moments where it doesn't work, and that did never happen with OS 7, but with OS 8, like in the Volkswagen Corporation cars, or also sometimes Mercedes failures. From the, these new infotainment, these complex infotainment systems tend to have more failures. And there we go with the instruments, and there we can also have this view change now. And when I start up the car, you can even better see that. These are then the full instruments, and here also with the RPM that goes like this. And then you can, for example, change the content, what you want to see, like here. And this then is then the Apple Maps, also on the left side instruments. When you have the Android Auto, then it also works with Google Maps, not in the CarPlay though. Here, or you can change the whole layout like this. I rather prefer the first one here, or what about you? And the head-up display is always a nice option to have, to have everything in your line of sight. Middle console is very interesting. First of all here, this is the inductive charging area. And this the, the smartphone gets a seat belt, like here. And these here are some gaps for the cooling. So the air is being sucked away from the backside so that the 
inductive charging doesn't overheat the smartphone. Oh, there's Schmoozy. Yeah, God bless her. My little love. She's gone off for a while. Yeah, I'm still sad, really sad. But here, seat belt. There we go. And then the, the smartphone is being kept tight, doesn't fly around the vehicle. And once again, it now also stays cool and is not overheating. Then here, cup holders, not adaptive. That's one thing that is missing, I think. Two USB-C chargers. And then you have this flying console. So you see here, you can grab underneath it. It's being away, take, taken away from the design of the iX. A very small shifting lever, still a real volume jog. I love that. And then you press it here to open this split. Well, this is our access to the BMW plant. And some space here, actually. But more space, definitely, underneath this whole element. Rear seating here. A little bit harder pack here in the rear doors. Hammer car and sound system also for the rear. And soft touch is then this here for the armrest. It's a very comfortable, rather upright seating position indeed. And you also have some leg room left. Not necessarily less than in bigger SUVs by BMW indeed. You can use this recess here as well. Of course, I could put my front seat a little bit more upright. That would also work indeed. And here with my height, 189 or 602, it also works headroom wise, although this is done in the panoramic roof. Here in the combustion engine version, that's the well, the only catch compromise on the interior, um, what, what you cannot get here for the I iX1, the EV, here, the slidable rear bench, 13 centimeters or 5 inches. This one is only possible in the non-EV version. You can also, once again, show you the difference when I'm, for example, putting... Uh, yeah, wait a minute. I put this one forward, then you can see the difference in the middle. So, this one here. Yeah, there you can see that, that difference. But, of course, most of the time, I want to go for most legroom. And you can... For one, two, three, adjust here the angle. Either sit a little bit more upright, like this, this is possible, or more land backwards, or then fold it completely, and then you're quite flexible. This one maybe as a ski hatch, or maybe just putting this one down and so on. Here also the nice perforation for the center tag, a leatherette. Very comfortable, also breathable, very soft material. And um, by the way, if you ask yourself, Oh, is it as durable? Yes, BMW has done some tests, long-term tests. You know, there are these testing facilities and they can ensure it has the very same durability as, for example, the animal skin leather. So uh, really a lot of progress in these material choices recently. So overall, the rear compartment here is very top-notch for a compact SUV, one of the best in the premium compact SUV segment. And here, USB-C chargers in this middle part. You do have some kind of a middle console. Of course, you also have the all-wheel drive transmission tunnel here, and also for rigidity reasons. But in the middle part, you can still sit. It's also fairly comfortable, of course, not as good as on the outside seats here. And Isofix, one, two possibilities in the front driver's seat. Extra two, so yeah, so here's also Isofix. So here, this weekend, have three Isofix points. Recently, got some messages from young family fathers and mothers asking for that. So, indeed, this one here, they thought of a lot of things also in detail. And here in this interior, this is not the M Sport, the X line. We have here the bright sensor tech seats, so in beige, these high grade leather seats. It looks really great, right? So, I think brings a lot more joy to the interior when you have the bright siding here. However, I prefer the M Sport from the dashboard because here in this normal dashboard, more high gloss black piano lacquer, not that so sporty look. And the steering wheel, it looks sporty also as a base styling, but not as sporty as in the M Sport. You don't have the special accentuations in the lower part and so on. So, um, I mean, you can also go with the uh, M Sport, for example, also with different seats, for example, but the dashboard for the M Sport looks just cooler, doesn't it? But yeah, bright seating here, so you have different color choices. That's also pretty cool, right? And more interior variation for you. These here are the brown sensor tech seats. Also here with the perforation, same material, just different color. And this interior also features the open cell eucalyptus wood. So really beautiful, more classic style here. This is also a nice choice, right? So either modern maybe in the M Sport then with the, um, you know, aluminum look. But you can see here, this one features the M Sport steering wheel, but still goes for the eucalyptus style here at the dashboard. So you can also vary that. Now to the trunk area, electric hatch. 
and then we have 540 up to 1600 liters i already folded two sides of that here also the cabin trolley easily fits in vertically so very well usable the only thing is that the compact suv doesn't have the longest length than here it's 80 centimeters here or about 31 inches so this where a longer sedan or an x3 would have just more trunk length the width however is a good meter or 40 inches so that's very well usable indeed and the total length to the seat as i would be driving is almost 170 in meters or 65 inches well the ix1 or the plug-in hybrid so the electrified or electric versions they have a little bit less of trunk space but only because well they have that too but then here this then a little bit is missing above the cover all versions are actually equal and that's a very cool thing and last but not least the height of this trunk might always be relevant like this is about yeah standard like 70 centimeters or 27 inches 20 almost 28 inches what about the trunk space for the ix1 indeed there are no compromises when you go electric as for the trunk space here and underneath you also have some space for your charging cables as for engines well there is a 1.5 liter three cylinder petrol engine based on that the plug-in hybrids but this one here is the two liter four cylinder petrol engine with around 200 horsepower and a 23i the top spec petrol engine also with all wheel drive this is a front wheel based platform so it's front plus rear than the all-wheel drive in this case 7.1 seconds is the acceleration figure you can also get a two liter four cylinder diesel and then also the ix1 the all electric version 5.6 seconds is the acceleration figure so it's actually quicker than also than the strongest petrol engine with that all-wheel drive version the ix1 the ev will be available as all-wheel drive but also as a front wheel drive only version that is then also a little bit slower and also the specs for the ix1 as for the battery 65 kilowatt hours net and then you can go some 400 kilometers or 250 miles we'll see later on if that's really true as for the efficiency 10 to 80 percent state of charge 29 minutes with a 130 kilowatt peak but here in this driving part today we'll both present you the petrol engine and the electric one and compare it Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the all-new BMW X1. Yeah, Michel and I, we always have a lot of fun here in the vehicles depot. Interesting, we have here the augmented reality view for the front camera. So we have the arrow here where I have to go. And maybe we'll hear that. There we go. Did you hear that sound? So that was when the traffic line is jumping to green and you're not starting. Then the car says like, hey, Thomas, wake the F up. It's time to go. The traffic light is green. That's an interesting feature, right? Because, you know, sometimes when the traffic light is red, we start talking to cameras or to other people, maybe. Yeah, I'm usually talking to cameras. Thank you. Poor me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I also talk to you. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, see, see now, now I reacted fast enough, so there was no beeping sound. And here we have these arrows going to the left now. So interesting, this augmented reality view and also the the camera feature we'll now enter the german autobahn yes motorway time my modes and then i'll pick sport uh, you cannot press it twice or something you have to press it once here and then select sport here more response from the throttle for example and we can also go to the sport shifting mode that even turns up the rpm even further for the autobahn not necessary but here to get the max out of this petrol engine and we start at 50 kilometers an hour and accelerate to 120. Let's go. Plop, that's it. That was 50 kilometers an hour to 120 kilometers an hour. And now when I'm reaching that goal here, I can go, for example, back to the personal or comfort mode, also go back to the normal de-shifting mode. Then the engine is also more silent. The iX1 will be quicker in the all-wheel drive version in the acceleration figure. It will be 1.5 seconds quicker in that acceleration figure, actually. Yeah, it's very interesting. Then the cruise control set here on the left side of the steering wheel. So good also to have real buttons for that. That's actually quite cool. And the X1 also gives you a good traveling feeling. It has the same platform just like the BMW 2 Series Active Tourer. And I really have to say in that new generation, they both come very very close before the difference was bigger 
but the interior here, the cockpit is basically the same. In the X1, you sit a little bit more upright. The 2 Series Active Tour, Tour has more a crossover feeling. This one here more already like a grown-up SUV feeling, but indeed they come close. If you think about difference being the X1 versus X3, the X3 gives you even a bigger SUV feeling. You sit higher, even more upright, a little bit more sophisticated. It's not that you would have more legroom in the rear. It's more in the front that you have this larger SUV feeling. But here already you have very good comfort. These new seats are really very good. The soft center tech material is also awesome. And also the Alcantara seat, that would also be good. Um, depending on which service you like better. You know, that's visual, cho visual choice. Visual choice. That's a tough one, right? You want to try that? Visual choice? Visual choice. Visual choice. You repeat, you repeat that three times at home, <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. So it's a little bit rainy outside today, uh, but we are still quite lucky with the filming. But we can test the noise insulation. It's actually quite decent, but you do hear a difference when you compare it to a 3 Series or X3, so that one platform above that, then they are a little bit more silent. But already here for this Combat XUV, um, you, you feel, hear the difference here when I lower the window. Um, we don't have dual insulation glass here, but still, there's a decent insulation. You hear the difference here now. Then um, I feel pretty much at home here, also on the on the German autobahn with this vehicle. It is basically all SUV you need already. If you compare it to the predecessor, of course, infotainment cockpit-wise, their most has been done actually. So interior build quality-wise, this is also pretty cool. So we've seen it recently even with Mercedes, for example, that the build quality in the interior and the materials being used are rather worse than before. But here BMW is really stepping up the game, making the interiors more premium. And yeah, especially interior-wise, BMW has become among the best in the business, actually, as for the premium interiors. That's really interesting. At the same time, investing a lot of money in sustainable interior material choices. So that's a good thing, definitely. Now, once again, S shifting mode, sport mode, it's a little bit complicated to choose that. From 100, <laughs> 150. Let's see how far we can go. Pull up, that's 180 kilometers an hour and still decently silent on the exterior. Of course, now it's a little bit louder, but the car is staying really upright, at the same time comfortable, 19-inch wheels. I would also stick with the 19-inch wheels, 20-inch wheels. They are just, visually, they are great. But comfort-wise, 19 is still, I think, a good compromise. And here, the car is really very stable. Um, what I feel here at higher speeds is that the steering here in this area is a little bit wake and then it's beginning here then I get the um, the feeling for it so this one here is too vague for me in this you know very small degree angles that's something I, I think they need to fix it is better actually with their larger SUVs now let's compare it when we yeah, that's too complicated to, to switch the driving modes here we go back to the normal comfort mode and normal shifting mode it's interesting yeah, this vague feeling stays and then it's a little bit lighter also towards the side. Um, from a suspension, definitely more comfortable. Let's switch it back again, sport mode. Yeah, I feel a little bit more the uneven parts of the rope, but here at the moment it's quite even. So even in the sport mode here with the depth of suspension, you still have a lot of comfort. That's of course a very, very cool thing to have. So. Indeed, it combines sportiness and comfort. That's something they can do very, very well. And also the seats hold you very tight. So indeed, you feel at home in the city, but at the same time, you can use it for long hauls on the motorway. That is actually a really excellent thing to do. How good can we follow actually, actually the GPS here while driving? In their bigger cars, you have some you know, somewhat bigger screen, but still it's big enough. And I also have the GPS information in the header display, for example, or you can go for that Apple Maps solution then, or the, uh, the Google Maps solution in the Android Auto connection that you also have 
uh, you know, things here in the instruments cluster, that will also be another possibility. So driving-wise, again, hardware-wise, yeah, one of the best compact SUVs indeed. When I think about the direct competitors, of course, it would be the Mercedes GLA or maybe also Mercedes GLB, depending on how you define it, and the Audi Q3, Audi Q3 um, Sportback. So there's this coupe, a non-coupe version here from the X1. Of course, there will be also the X2 then in the next generation. X2 would be the direct competitor to the Q3 Sport, Sportback. Um, yeah, and we had the recently that, um, you know, the small Lexus SUV, compact Lexus SUV, for example. And I feel that user interface-wise, the Audi Q3 would be easiest to use. Driving dynamics-wise, the X1 and the Q3 come really close because they both combine sportiness and comfort. With the GLA, is more set on a, let's say, softer, slower note, unless you go for the AMG model. Here already, when you have the, the suspension, does a great job, but also already the base model feels sporty. And yeah, it's a lot of fun to drive the X1. So I think if you compare it to the oh, Cayenne with a, it's like a wedding Cayenne seen that is that even legal it didn't have a proper license plate on like it just like handwriting usually in germany you can't do that you know so uh, as soon as you see something like that the police would stop you at some point yeah i haven't seen it quite often now getting off the motorway and more like countryside driving and we can we have no one facing us we can also do some more slalom different driving modes and testing for example here so yeah the steering is not not most natural in the feeling it feels sporty and I talked to um, BMW representatives about that also because I criticized it over in the 3 series and they say mm, by making the steering lighter uh, and less natural in a way they convey a feeling that the car itself feels lighter you can follow this argument because, yeah, when the steering is light, the whole car somehow feels light, yes. And in a way, maybe more modern, I think. But I always prefer more that I have a natural feeling for the car. And if I have more resistance in the steering, then I feel more one with the vehicle, you know, to combine driver, car and road, that somehow there is a connection you can really feel. And here it's a little bit moving through thin air. Sure, that might be also something of the M Sport or so, but I felt in the 2 Series Active Tourer it was a little bit better. Hmm. Sometimes strange, of course, every single model gets also the individual uh, setup for that. Here, by the way, when you go just to the S shifting mode, then you can stay in the normal uh, driving mode, but just have the shifting set up that here. car is shifting up later when you are in the S shifting mode, whereas when you're in the D shifting mode, it's more about fuel economy, shifting up earlier and so on and shifting down later. So you can also vary that if you, for example, want to keep in the comfortable suspension mode or just want to change the shifting for maybe like quick out one overtaking. However, at the same time, what you can always also do is use the pin down, even if you are in the most comfortable and most relaxed driving mode, pin down here and then you also get um, the acceleration. But the other one would be more spontaneous or using these shifting pedals to shift down or up here. And here this boost mode, told you earlier, when you click and hold it, then you have 10 seconds of boost and is there's also this multiple shift down possible. So this is also another possibility to stay in a normal driving mode, for example. And then you say, ah, you know, I want to have the boost now. Click and hold it, and then you've got that. But yeah, I'm not really sure if you would really use it in everyday driving life. Um, yeah, maybe then this, this, this manual shift down, one or two clicks, I think it just goes faster than clicking and holding it. I think this function is a little bit yeah, redundant or not really that, that much needed, you know. So to me, a big thing here about the X1, especially in this new generation, is the driving fun. You can have a comfortable vehicle on the motorway at the same time, 
you have a sporty one for countryside roads and so on. That's a cool thing to have, definitely. So it feels really elaborated and modern. This is what I really love about this vehicle with some shortcomings here, as I said, of the climate unit that I can't control it that well while driving. When you are a guy that leaves 22 degrees Celsius or like 72 degrees Fahrenheit in auto mode all the time, then you couldn't care less, you know, then you don't need the knobs anyway. But I am this climate control control guy. AC on, AC off, vent strength up, vent strength down, colder, warmer. I'm always changing it because, yeah, just want to do it <laughs> to feel more comfortable in the vehicle. And uh, yeah, you feel somehow more in control of what the vehicle is doing. That's what I think. You know, once again, in these faster corners, yeah, that feels really beautiful. And you can, you can leave everything in the normal driving mode. It feels really excellent. I love that. So playing together with the suspension then as well, the adaptive suspension, yeah, driving dynamics wise, they are really top notch on top of the game. So yeah, from everything we've experienced, Besides maybe that I don't like the OS8, it is one of the best compact SUVs out there. And inside the BMW portfolio, yeah, the 2 Series Active 2 probably has the even better price performance ratio. So that was also one of the interesting findings for today that, yeah, no one would have expected that. The 2 Series Active 2 is definitely a strong internal competitor to the X1 now you have to bear that in mind. So maybe, you know, check it out at the dealer if that's available on your market, you know. Um, that, of course, also depends, but especially for the European market and 2 Series Agriptura or X1, you can pick between these two and then just see which one is more suitable to you. So, yeah, that's one of the interesting findings for today. And our fuel economy result here, consumption for the ICE, internal combustion engine, 23i, is something less than 7 liters on 1 kilometers about 35 mpg us some 44 mpg uk and now the ix1 electric <laughs> yeah that's the acceleration really strong um can you see the acceleration figure in the display let me change that for you so the best experience for you so now you can see the speed better right yeah, now you can see the speed. So you have instant torque with this one, 1.5 seconds faster in the acceleration figure if you compare it to the petrol engine. Here, for example, like 50 to 70, like 45 to 70. Plop, that's it already. So super, super quick indeed. These iconic sounds uh, are on indeed. So you can also turn them off if you like. And well, you have to know where they are actually. Uh, it's where was it again? Driving settings. There are iconic sounds off. And then it's like, here, yeah, there's nothing, you know? Again, the difference then. And we can also go into sports mode and they're even more extreme. So now sports mode. Woo. So have you heard the difference to the normal mode? We go to the normal mode again. <laughs> And the sports mode, <laughs> more low frequent sound indeed. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. And the only thing is like when you switch around things here, it's always tricky actually to do that while driving. You know, you have, don't have this central control knob anymore here in the new X1. You always have to search for some functions, of course, you know, you get used to some, definitely. Um, here, the driving settings are quite important, definitely. Here, to turn that these ones off or on. on. Um, and if you click in there, you can also change what kind of recuperation you want to have in the normal D driving mode. For example, adaptive, high, moderate, or low, so different adaptive modes. So when I'm in the normal D driving mode and I have adaptive activated, that means actually when I lift my throttle and there's no one in front of me, the car is rather rolling, there's no recuperation, so there's no, you know, I'm just rolling and there's no, you know, getting slower and so on. 
but I can soon show you that when I'm approaching the vehicle that is then closer, it almost works like the adaptive cruise control, then this adaptive recuperation, or here, recognize I'm a little bit too fast, there's 70, it's a speed limit, then for example also the recuperation could be worked, or now the map data indicate that we're going down it for a longer time. This is also a case where the adaptive recuperation could reduce the speed. Or then, indeed, in combination with the cruise control that this is happening, for example. And this could be a compromise between one pedal driving and a strong recuperation and no recuperation and rolling and just recuperation on demand by the brake pedal. You can also induce that either here and then in the menu or easier here with the shifting lever pull it backwards and then it is in the B mode and in B mode then I lift my foot off the throttle and then there is strong recuperation. So depending on what you like or for example you're going downhill for a longer period of time then you would also go into that B mode and then you have a strong recuperation. As for driving it, it's a lot of fun. It's so much more spontaneous and sporty than the petrol engine. The petrol engine already felt good with that vehicle but here you have more weight, yes, but you have a low center of gravity. The car is, although it's raining now, I feel it's hooking up better to the road. And you have this great acceleration out of the corners. Um, it does have front wheel bias in a way because most of the time the front electric motor is used. The rear then on demand, the more you push the throttle, when you really hammer it out, as I did earlier, then you can have up to a 50-50 overdrive distribution. They usually try to use the front electric motor because it is a little bit more efficient than the rear one or not using the rear one when you're just rather rolling and so on, but when you use as much power as you try or want, then again you can reach up to 50-50 distribution. At a later stage also only the front wheel drive model will be available. So especially in sport mode, super spontaneous. Let's go back to the normal mode, see how that one turns out. Here now in the corner, accelerating out. It's a little bit smoother, not that direct from the throttle input, but you can have this power output all the time when you just pin it down. Or what's also possible, using the left pedal here, there's no right pedal then here in the EV version. With the left pedal, you can have the sporty boost for 10 seconds and it immediately goes forward. So that would be an alternative to, um, to switch through the driving modes. So you have a lot of different driving modes and settings and boost options. The question is, will you ever need all of them? Probably not. You will probably uh, find out which one you really like best and then use these over time. For most cases and also driving data indicate that most car owners just keep everything in the standard modes and just use the vehicle and uh, and that's it. But it's good to know what the car is capable of, definitely. And also in normal mode, you can always hit the throttle and have great acceleration. The sound is also subtle enough, but as I shown to you earlier, you can also turn these sounds off to have a pure silent driving experience. And indeed, comparing here the petrol engine and the full electric version, this EV is indeed much, for, much more fun to drive. It's really astonishing. It feels more agile in corners actually, although it is heavier. And of course, the stronger acceleration, yeah. Here when driving slow, of course, it's all silent. This is also a cool thing. So you have no engine noise at all. And after all, the combustion engine is a four cylinder. So if you would think like, hey, I'm driving a six or eight cylinder, versus an EV, then more of the sound is missing. There's a bigger difference, but four cylinder versus EV, then it's not that big of a case that you would miss the combustion engine sound or something, you know? So in this case, then the advantages of the EV really play a role with silence at low speeds, well, the iconic sounds on demand, but really this spontaneous acceleration, but you can also drive it smoothly if you want to. And yeah, the agility is really enhanced by the EV here. Steering is more or less the same. Once again, I think it's a little vague in the short degree angles here. 
yeah, that is too vague definitely. But then to the sides, it gets a little bit more feeling, but that's the same ICE and EV. Also seating comfort and so on, and the whole experience of the vehicle is more or less the same. It's really that drivetrain and also the weight distribution. So, and yeah, you might think that it is bad if, you, if there's more weight, but since it's really put in the lower end of the vehicle, it really helps the vehicle. The only thing, when you are in really, really tight corners and then the car is pushing to the outside of the corner, then more weight is bad actually. But in normal situations, and for example, when the corners are a little bit more, you know, a little bit wider, which is the case in most cases in public traffic, then it's actually more fun with this different waste distribution. But don't get me wrong, the 23i we've been driven earlier, that is a really cool fitting engine to the vehicle, no doubt. And it felt really one with the vehicle. But this drivetrain here also feels one with the vehicle. There are two things actually majorly about this car and the range. First of all, the kilowatt hour net figure that has been enhanced. If you compare it to our studio episode, they worked on that to give you more usable battery size. Now it's 65 kilowatt hours net. And the second thing is that they really improved aerodynamics because bear in mind, it's really interesting, already in normal city driving, and let's say everything driving besides motorway. Already more than a third of the consumption has to do with the aerodynamics. And on motorway driving, autobahn, higher speed, it's two thirds of the consumption that goes back to aerodynamics, not efficiency of anything else. So aerodynamics, and especially with electric vehicles, is key. And that's why they also majorly had to work here on this one. So, very impressive ride here with the iX1, the most fun you can have with the all new X1, definitely. And to me, no doubt, either petrol or if the charging infrastructure is okay for you, go directly with the EV. And we'll drive it a little bit further now and then have a final energy economy and final real world range result. And the iX1 test consumption for today, 18 around 18 kilowatt hours and 100 kilometers. We can deduct a little bit because of the acceleration tests. That would be some 30 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. So overall real world range in our test today, around 350 kilometers or 220 miles. And again, maybe a little bit better would be possible if there were no acceleration tests at all. Overall, a quite decent result considering the size of the battery. It's not a too big battery. We knew that before. Again, a little bit better would be possible. It's not the best in the competition, not at all in the range. Efficiency is actually quite good, yes, but it's also not really very bad. So something average in between. And if you now compare petrol versus EV as, as for the costs, here in Germany, although we have most expensive energy price in the world together with Denmark, still here, I would have paid for the same trip with a petrol engine, like one kilometers, about 14 euros in petrol, and here about like six, seven euros in, um, you know, in energy. And that's actually half the running cost then for the iX1. And it will be even cheaper, of course, if energy is cheaper in your country. That's very interesting, isn't it? And now compare also the direct competitor of this one, the Audi Q3. And well, I told you, competitor of the iX1, or especially in the X1, because there's no EV pendant, so the X1 versus the BMW 2 Series Active Tourer. Tune into that one.